It is my uh, true honor and pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Cindy Blackstock here to the stage. And uh, we sent a request over uh, to uh, Dr. Blackstock last year for our conference, but she was book solid. She's a very busy, uh, busy person fighting for our people. And uh, this year we went early to make sure that we got, uh, got a hold of uh, her to do a keynote at our conference. Because the message and the work that she puts forward for our children is something that everyone needs to hear and everybody needs to be on board with. That despite the, uh, the obstacles in our way, it's possible to help our kids with dedication, with passion, with just sheer grit and determination. We don't need non-Indigenous people to save us. It's us that will do it. And with the court case that was just recently won, and, uh, and helping our child welfare, uh, uh, helping us dis eliminate the racism and the ignorance and the discrimination of our children. It gives me hope that there's hope for our education system that we can do this as well. And there's a bio to read and it's a lengthy of all the great deeds. But it has to come from my heart and I really appreciate. And I know I speak for a lot of people in the audience the work that Dr. Blackstock has done for our people across Canada. And we are honored here, Think Indigenous, that you are coming here to share your words and share your determination and your heart and passion to help our people. And I hope that we're inspired by the words that she shares here today. So I'd like to call up a lady here that I admire beyond words. Let's join and welcome Cindy Blackstock to the stage. So what a great honor it is to be on Treaty 6 territory. And with all of you at this historical moment. You know, I hang out a lot with kids because I have to balance out the sense kids make with the nonsense that too many politicians make. And kids understand equality. And kids understand love. And they understand fairness. You know, sometimes we have to remind ourselves that children are not just learners, they're teachers. And a young boy, Elliot, he said, you know the crazy thing about history, about great moments in our time of humanity, is almost nobody knows they're in the middle of it. And even those people who know they're in the middle of it don't know what to do. Children are experts at reconciliation. They know that the power of reconciliation is not just in the knowing. It is in the doing something about it. And that has always been where the government of Canada has failed. It hasn't been because they don't know the answers because many of you in this room have told them what the next step needs to be. It has been in the failure to implement it. And it has also been in our collective, our collective agreement with what I call incremental inequality. And what do I mean by that? Well, First Nations children are shortchanged across every area of their experience. And yet, we are happy when they give us a few extra dollars for education or a few extra dollars for child welfare, when what we really need to be doing is demanding equity across all areas of their experience. Because no other child in this country has to fight with their childhood to get treated equally by the government of Canada. And we need to make sure that doesn't happen again. All of us. Because kids codify that discrimination as being about them. It's, not, it's a very young age when they start to believe that they're not worth the money. And when they don't see all of us standing up against it, it makes it even harder. It makes it feel much more hopeless. So we have to stand up with our kids because not only are they reconciliation's best hope, they are the future of our nations. 
And without them, without our, uh, exercising our duty to stand up for kids, there will be no indigenous education in the future. There will be no indigenous child welfare. There will be no indigenous languages. And there will be no indigenous lands. So we must take care of them. They are everything. They are more important than we are. This story goes way back about child welfare. This is a document few people have seen. And some of you way over there are not going to see it. <laughs> um, but it is a document from 1895. And it is a request for a warrant by Duncan Campbell Scott. It is one of the earliest documents I've seen on residential schools. But it's also the earliest child welfare document that I've had in my hand. You see, Duncan Campbell Scott was writing to the Canadian government to get a warrant for the removal of First Nations children so they could be placed in Indian residential schools for the purposes of education. But also, the same warrant allowed for the removal of First Nations children because they were not properly cared for. Now, the not properly cared for definition is very close to what our definitions are of neglect today. Very close. And so, uh, what it was is when families were poor, when families were traumatized because of colonization, when families didn't have enough food to eat, and when families didn't have proper housing. But the important thing that this document also shows us is there was never any thinking about the major and most important question, which is, does the government have something better to offer them? So when we remove a child, as an Aboriginal woman in Australia who was in child welfare care said, in that time when you remove me, you promise me a better life, and you really have never delivered. Now, I'm not a utopian thinker. I think some of our kids need to be in child welfare care. But not at the rates that we're seeing today, and certainly not at the rates we saw then. By 1967, there's a guy named Caldwell who comes to study the residential schools here in Saskatchewan. He finds that 80% of the children in residential schools during that time were placed there because of that not properly cared for provision. They really were child welfare placements. And in some ways, it's wrong to think of the 60s group as only being child welfare, because it was child welfare and residential schools together. Both of those things serve the same function. Now, a lot of people, maybe not all of you, but a lot of people think there were never people of the period who stood up against this. But there were. And this next man is one of my greatest heroes. His name is Dr. Peter Henderson Bryce. Does anybody know him? Yeah, a few of you do. So Dr. Bryce was born in Mount Pleasant, Ontario, in, uh, he, outside of the Six Nations Reserve. And he uh, graduated from the University of Toronto when Canada was only nine years old. His father was a blacksmith, and his brother has a building named for him at the University of Manitoba, right? for those of you who have been there. Now, Dr. Bryce uh, was the first uh, medical health officer in the province of Ontario. He wrote Canada's first health code, which then became a model for all over North America. But at 51 years of age, he was appointed as the chief medical health officer for Indian Affairs in 1904. And he was an expert in tuberculosis, so he was asked to go out and survey the health of the kids at residential schools. And what he found was made him gasp. 24% of the children were dying every year. And if you followed them over three years, 48% had passed away. In File Hills Residential School, 76% of the children had passed by the time they were 16. Now, he comes back to Ottawa, and he says, medical science knows just what to do. Even back then, they knew. You don't put sick children in with healthy children. You make sure that children aren't exhausted, that they have good food, they have enough sleep, they have the medicine that they had back then, 
If you did all of those things, Dr. Bryce said, you could save their lives. It would have cost ten to fifteen thousand dollars. That's it. It's only about four hundred thousand dollars in today's time. But the government of Canada wouldn't do it. They said it cost too much money. But Dr. Bryce was not silent. He kept speaking up, even though he worked for the government. He challenged them. And the government of Canada acted quickly. They cut his research funding. They stopped him from presenting his findings at conferences. They stopped him from being promoted. And they eventually pushed him out of the public service altogether in 1922. And in 1922, Dr. Bryce responds to that by publishing a manuscript known as The National Crime. And he publishes this manuscript showing all the horrible things happening to these kids and what could be done to save them. And he hands that out to every member of parliament, to all the churches and any business leaders he could know. And you can see here, this is the front page of the Ottawa Citizen. Back in 1907, he even leaked his report to the Ottawa Citizen, then known as the Evening Citizen. His hope was that when people read the headlines, they'd be so upset they would make the government do what it wasn't going to do just as a matter of course. And there were others that heard him. There was a man named Samuel Hume Blake, who is the founder of the Blake's Law Firm that some of you know. And uh, he said about Bryce's work, he said that in that Canada fails to obviate the preventable causes of death, it brings itself into unpleasant nearness with manslaughter. So time and time again throughout history, people like Dr. Bryce have always stood up against the government. The government has always known what it was doing was wrong and had the solutions to solve it, but they didn't implement it. And Dr. Bryce, he has a role in the case as well. You see, the day before Prime Minister Harper apologized for residential schools, I realized that Dr. Bryce was buried just a few kilometers away from where I live in Ottawa in Beechwood Cemetery. So I went and I got a batch of brightly colored daisies to represent the brightness of children. And I went there to his tombstone and I thanked him for everything that he had tried to do. And I told him about the child welfare case and I told him I would be back when the kids won. Right? Little did I know that would be nine years later. Now, it wasn't just non-Aboriginal people standing up for First Nations kids. This is a letter written by a little boy called Edward B. in the Christmas season of 1923. His letter reads, Dear Parent, that's who it's addressed to. But he's talking about how hungry the boys are in the schools. They're so hungry in the school he's going to that they're eating cats and they're eating wheat. And the teacher treats him so cruelly the only thing this child can think to do is to try and strike back at her the next time she's cruel. Now, although the letter is addressed to your parent, it actually ended up in the hands of Duncan Campbell Scott in Ottawa. And Duncan Campbell Scott's uh, response was that 99% of the children are too fat in residential schools anyway. And keep in mind, this is a year after Dr. Bryce's national crime report. So there were times throughout history when the Canadian government had the opportunity to do the right thing and didn't do it. And that's where we all become involved. Because without the action, without the receipt of the letter, without standing up against these inequalities, they will continue as they have throughout entire time. It brings us to today. Sheila Fraser, the Auditor General, and now Michael Ferguson, the current Auditor General, has confirmed what we've all known firsthand at our communities, is that First Nations children on reserve receive far less funding for every public service than everybody else. And that has been going on since Confederation. And this reason for this is, of course, that provincial child welfare, education, and health laws have been forced on the federal government onto First Nations communities. 
And that itself is a matter of significant controversy, rightly so, because those laws have not proven that effective for First Nations children. But the federal government funds it. The federal government funds it. And so what does this mean, right? A non-Aboriginal girl that I work with, she said, you know, Cindy, discrimination is when the government doesn't think you're worth the money. So how does it feel to be a child that's worth, not worth the money? How would it feel to go to a school that's run down, where the teachers are not given enough support to be able to teach you or learn, teach you your culture and your language, where you go home and there may not be clean water to drink, you might not have a toilet, where your house is overcrowded, where you go then to uh, get some support for your family and they're going to get less than everybody else. Children don't know that the federal government is underfunding them. They just feel like there isn't any hope. They see other children in the country doing better, and they don't understand why they're not doing better. And too often, I think we get distracted by the symptoms of discrimination, right? We try to deal with how it emerges instead of dealing with the source of it. So this is one of the kids that the government doesn't think the worth of the money but to me means everything. And her name is Shannon Kustachin. Who knows Shannon Kustachin? Yeah, she's a great hero, isn't she? I met Shannon personally, I'll still remember her, uh, standing in Victoria Island in Ottawa with her beautiful black ponytails and her sign about education rights. And at that time, she was about 12 years old. She's from the Attawapiskat First Nation. And um, she is a child who loved to learn. She loves to learn. And when she was in kindergarten, the only school in her community was closed because it sat on a toxic waste dump of 30,000 gallons of diesel. The federal government closed that school but put portable trailers on the playground of the contaminated site. So where this beautiful little five-year-old would have went to school with her friends was only a stone's throw away from that contamination. Now, the federal government promised, promised the children a new school three times, the minister did. But they failed to deliver. And she's a Cree girl, so she was born, uh, brought up in her tradition. She spoke Cree was her first language. And she could not understand how someone could call themselves a leader and then break their promises to children. So she saw the portables getting run down, as she said, Kids as young as grade four were dropping out because they had no hope, because the heat would go off, there were rats in the building, there was black mold infestations. So she goes down to Ottawa, and she meets with Minister Chuck Strahl. And she says, are you going to give us money for a new school or not? And when he says no, they can't afford it, she says, I don't believe you. And I will never give up because school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this. And who does she reach out to? She reaches out to other children. She understands firsthand that kids get fairness and inequality better than adults do. So she does a YouTube video and she asks that non-Aboriginal children join her movement and send letters to the Prime Minister. And thousands and thousands of non-Aboriginal children rose to the challenge. First Nations children in school started to realize that they had the power to write to the Prime Minister. They didn't have to suffer in these conditions. They could join their leadership and their community and be a part of the movement of change. Now, Shannon Kustachin wanted to become a human rights lawyer. She wanted to stand up for the education rights of all kids. But she couldn't go to school in her community, the underfunded high school in her community, and achieve that. It didn't matter how hard the teachers tried. There was no science lab. There were no computers, and there was no library. So she has to go hundreds of miles away to go to school in New Liskert. And it was on her way back to school one day. In that school, she would have never gone to had she not been discriminated against that she passes away in a car accident in 2010. The Cree elders in her community said that uh, Shannon was a teacher. 
And the question, she had done her job, but the question is, what did all of us learn from her? What did we learn from her? Well, the children learned a lot from Shannon. Within 24 hours of her passing, they set up a Facebook page called Shannon's Dream. They wanted to honor their friend who had inspired them to believe that even children can change the world. But they also pledged that they would never give up because school's a time for dreams and every kid deserves this. So if you come to Ottawa on a regular day, you're going to see lots of kids sending letters to Prime Minister Trudeau because kids understand that political promises don't mean anything until children's lives get better. So I'm going to ask all of you, are you going to sign up for Shanna's Dream? Are you going to get your kids to sign up for Shanna's Dream? <laughs> Remember I talked about that toxic potion of incremental equality, how we're happy that we're getting a little bit less inequality than we had before. This is why it's dangerous. This report is actually in my office. I hold on to old documents, and it's written in 1967. It was a report commissioned by Indian Affairs uh, on First Nations education in Ontario, but I think you could agree that it probably would apply here. Because what Sim says is, let someone hazard a guess as to what year or what century significant changes towards real equality will be noted in the achievement of the children. And what he is talking about there is First Nations children. That was written in 1967, I was three years old. And we're still at it. That's the danger of incremental equality. It never comes, it never comes. That's why people like Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela knew that the charge was to go for respect and honor and equality, not for just taking it one piece or one program at a time. And this brings us to today. This, uh, this is one of the documents in the tribunal. Uh, we got a lot of documents on education in the tribunal. Uh, this one is about reallocation. So what the federal government is saying in this slide is they, it's dated 2013. It is a secret document. And it was uh, for, I think, a presentation to the director general in Ottawa, which is uh, just a couple of layers below the minister. And what they're showing here is that they are admitting that they're underfunding education, child welfare, and social assistance. And instead of trying to go to Treasury Board and get more money for all these underfunded programs, what they're doing is they're transferring money out of infrastructure. And infrastructure, in non-bureaucratic speak, pays for building schools, for building homes, for water, fire protection, housing. And they are transferring, as you can see here, over a period of six years, over a half a billion dollars over to try and cover up those shortfalls, but it's still not enough. So that's why the government often would be out announcing new schools for communities that never get built. Because they're shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic here, right? They are not dealing with the major problem. Now, this is a uh, report. The government puts out a lot of reports. And this is from 2013 and 14. And what was so crazy is, even though they know education is underfunded, in 2013 and 14, the federal government actually sent back to Treasury Board $86 million in education funding that it didn't spend. Now, what could have you done with $86 million for your kids, right? That's where, in my view, the federal surplus came out at the election, right? As they would claw back all this money that could really have done a huge benefit for kids but wasn't spent. So you can find that on the uh, Aboriginal Affairs uh, website. But these types of figures are buried in these long reports, right? And unless you're as, uh, uh, I guess you have, uh, you live as boring of a life as I do, you don't read the whole thing, right? I think they count on that sometimes. This is another one. It talks about the consequences of the inequality. Now, this is a uh, ANSI performance report. It was available recently on their website. You may be able to still find it. And um, what it shows is the literacy rates for kids, right? 
So, um, and these are for places that have standardized testing. Saskatchewan isn't on here, but you're going to find for boys, the lowest is like 16% in the Atlantic provinces on numeracy. And if we uh, go to literacy, we're looking at 21% for boys in literacy and 32% for girls. To find literacy levels that low in Canada, it's impossible for other populations. You really have to go to developing nations to find literacy levels that low. And that's a consequence of underfunding, right? These children are bright, capable children. Their teachers are committed teachers. But when you don't have the tools and support, that's what you end up with, right? And how are these children going to be able to realize their dreams when this is where they're sitting, according to the Aboriginal Affairs Performance Report? Now, he was, uh, Minister Valcour was asked about this in House of Commons. And he said, um, they were talking about the decrease in the education budget. There's a $137 million decrease, he says. I want the record to indicate that the $137 million decrease, which is needed, in, which is indeed in the estimates, reflects the sunset of the original $115 million provided in 2014-15, as well as $18.4 million, which was reprofiled, which means they spent it on something else. Right? So sunsetting means that they have funded a program they're no longer funding. You notice that word like sunset, reprofiled. It makes it sound neutral. But the impacts on children are not neutral, right? They're really not. Uh, how many of you saw 16 by 9 Global's uh, program on First Nations education? It was excellent, huh? Uh, please show this in your education classrooms and view it yourself. This is a program that came out two weeks ago, and it profiles a girl like Shannon, who's 14 years old, and she's having to leave her family to go to school in Thunder Bay. And it shows the conditions not only that she has to live in as a girl, and as some of the boys that she's going to school with, but it follows her going back to her home community to meet her family. And they show the conditions of the elementary school there. And one of the things that really struck out for me is the boys' bathrooms, urinals, don't work. There's no water. So the only way that that can be dealt with is when the janitor, at the end of the day, throws water down there. And I'm thinking, if we can't even give kids a dignified way of using the bathroom, then what message does that send to them, right? What message does that send to them, right? So do watch this program and uh, send it along to everyone, because it really shows how the discrimination is manifesting at the level of children. But we know education is only one part of this underfunding, right? And what, that's why I think it's so important that we all band together to demand inequality and end to it across all programs. In child welfare, I had the honor of working with many other people and the federal government to document the shortfalls in child welfare funding in 2000 in a report called the National Policy Review. Raymond Shingoose and Daryl Dubois and others from Saskatchewan were involved in that. We found that the shortfall was 22%. The federal government agrees with it. We even get a letter from the minister saying, good report, we like the recommendations, and they do nothing. Then in 2005, what they said they needed was a more detailed report. So we do the same thing again. We actually involve five economists. We cost it out down to the penny, the shortfall. It's now 30%. And the biggest shortfall is in services to keep families safely together. The federal government's minister sends us another letter saying how good the report is. But they do nothing. And that brings us to all an important point. How long do you keep talking to the government while they do nothing? How long until we peacefully and respectfully protest against something like this? Well, when we created the Caring Society in 2000, we had a great elder's advice. 
And he said, never fall in love with the Caring Society. And never fall in love with your business card. Only fall in love with the kids, because if you fall, there may come a time when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. In 2007, the Caring Society received a large chunk of our money from the federal government. But we remembered that elder's teaching. So we realized we needed to do something differently. And we partnered with the Assembly of First Nations, and we filed a human rights complaint against the federal government alleging that they are racially discriminating against 163,000 kids by failing to provide equitable child welfare services and failing to implement Jordan's principle to ensure they get equitable access to government services. Now, the federal government responded quickly. Within 30 days, they cut all of our federal funding. The Caring Society is the only national nonprofit that receives no funding at all from any level of government, even up until today. We had $50,000 in the bank, and we were going up against the biggest law firm in the country. Like many of you, some, of, some people around me said, well, you're never going to be able to do it, right? And I said, you might be right. But I want to show this generation of kids that we love them enough to stand up for them. And even if that means the Caring Society goes down, that is the least we're going to do. But thankfully, we were able to keep going. And uh, we created this campaign called I Am a Witness because I really believe that discrimination's best friend is silence and inaction. And too many of our court cases are argued in a courtroom without anybody watching. So we created this website where we load all of Canada's court documents, all of ours. We don't ask people to take a side. We simply ask you to watch. And it's now the most watched human rights case in Canadian history. So one of the things I want you to do and your students to do is to sign up to be a witness. Are you going to do that? Yeah? You can do it. It's free. Now, back to the kids. It was lonely when we filed that case. Hardly anybody was there. A lot of people were keeping their distance from the Caring Society. Don't want to get too close to the Caring Society because the feds might cut your funding too. And it wasn't all that interesting in the early days because the federal government was trying to dismiss it on legal technicalities. They would bring eight different motions to try and dismiss it on legal technicalities. And even though we had the I Am a Witness campaign and we invited people to come to the courtrooms, often they were empty. But all that changed in 2010. I was going to be cross-examined by the federal government on one of their legal technicalities. And I walked in, I was hoping there'd be people there, and there was nobody there. But then walked in a group of high school students. And this young man comes over and he says, we're from alternative school, which means we get into trouble a lot. And I said, that's good, because so do I. And he said, uh, you know, sometimes we deserve it, but sometimes it's the systems that deserve to be in trouble, and hardly any adults ever take them on. But all of you guys are doing it, and we want to be here to help. So not only did they come, they came the next set of hearings wearing I Am a Witness t-shirts, and they brought their brothers and sisters. So by 2012, there were so many children coming to the hearings, we had to move them to the Supreme Court and book them in in shifts, right? So this is a picture of the kids in 2012. Now imagine this. You are a government. You are arguing against equality rights for kids. Are you more uh, uh, nervous turning around and seeing a group like you or a group like them? All right? And what do kids possibly get out of this? Well, these kids were lovely, right, because they're children. So they decided one of the things they wanted to do is get all the autographs of the lawyers. <laughs> so they have autograph books. And um, the lawyers who didn't want to come so near to the kids uh, but, but the kids are smart, right? They realize these lawyers in this court had to wear those robes, and there's a place where they go to put them on. 
So they just stood on guard right there by the robing room. And I overheard this uh, one little guy say to one of Canada's lawyers, is Stephen Harper here? <laughs> and the lawyer said, no, he's a busy man. He can't be here today. And so the kid says, well, how do you know what to say? <laughs> because my teacher told me that lawyers have to take the instructions from their boss. And if your boss isn't here, how do you know what to say? And then I heard the lawyer said he had to go then. <laughs> right? So the children started to bring their parents. And they understood that they would have to keep this up ever, all the time. That you can't just have one event and give, forget about the kids. That you have to keep writing and showing up as long as it takes for children's lives to change. Just like their friend Shannon had done. She didn't give up when the government said no. She kept going. And here's what some of the kids saw in the evidence. So they were here watching the case. This is one of Canada's documents. And it shows uh, it's a secret document, October 31, 2012. And it shows how severe the shortfall is in First Nations Child Welfare Funding, $420 million in this document. And um, they say in their own documents that the First Nations children, their funding is woefully inadequate. That's their words. Creating, quote, circumstances that are dire. Placing children at high likelihood for death. And they have these PowerPoints, and they're still not doing anything. They're fighting us in court, right? They're fighting us in court. Now, we all know with uh, Jordan's principles about ensuring equitable access to government services. And the federal government adopted it in 2007, but then created a definition so narrow, no child in a country ever qualified. They, the federal government's official position is there are no Jordan's principle cases. So let me ask the group here, does anybody know of a First Nations child who's been denied or delayed receipt of a service that would otherwise be available without question to a non-Aboriginal kid? right now so all the government needs to do is come and talk to you right but behind the scenes while they were publicly saying there's no cases this is a document from Manitoba with Health Canada and INAC where they are listing one example after another where First Nations kids get less in this example they're saying there's a child with a disability they require a wheelchair a lift and a stroller if the child is non-Aboriginal, they receive all of those services when medically required. But if you're a First Nations child, you only get one piece of equipment every five years. That's it. So think about it. Even if the, you had a baby, it would take till the child's 15 to get all the pieces of equipment. And I am not a doctor, but even I know kids grow. So what you had for that child when they were a toddler is not going to be suitable for a 15-year-old. And the, it, the lift has to be self-installed. Now, I don't know how all your carpentry skills are, but I promise you, you would not want to be in a lift that I installed. Right? So this is the government clearly saying in its own documents that it's discriminating. Right? Now, the federal government um, did not have a good case when the evidence finally came out. I think that's why they tried so hard to fight it on legal technicalities. And these are their final written arguments. Now, um, one thing you should know is that the federal government did call an expert witness. They called KPMG, the accounting firm, to try and discredit all of the um, uh, calculations of the shortfall that we had done together a number of years ago. They paid, I think, 400000 for that report. Um, but KPMG's calculations came within 0.025% of our calculation of the shortfall. So we actually filed their expert report on our side of the case. And they never could find even one person to speak as an expert on their side of the case. So you have their own expert witness going against them, their own documents admitting the inequality. So what are you going to say in final written submissions? This is October 2014. You can read the full document online. What they say is, 
these documents from our officials are not actually views of the department. These are personal views of our employees at given periods of time. That's the strength of the federal argument. And they also say, they imply that you really can't believe government documents. Uh, I think most, most of us have some skepticism, but the, I mean, it's, hard, it's bizarre to hear that from, from the government themselves. So we waited 15 months for the ruling, right? All of us. And I want to thank all of you who sent your prayers and your support to us while we were going through this process. It really was a collective process. And for all your kids who were involved too, right? Because really they were just personally my source of inspiration, right? So the judgment comes out. And a panel assesses the government of Canada's arguments as unreasonable, unconvincing, and not supported by the preponderance of the evidence. That's what it says in the ruling. And um, I could have told them that 20 years ago. But it's important that the, an independent panel came to that conclusion. And I do want to take this moment just to honor Member Belanger here. It was a three-person panel, and tragically, Member Belanger passed away just two weeks, uh, two months before the ruling. But I think all of us, um, you know, would be thankful to know that he spent the last year of his life trying to write a decision to stand up for our kids. So we need to be grateful to him and his family for doing that. So we win the decision, all of us, right? You saw it on TV, I hope. That was our collective win for all the kids. The federal government welcomed the decision, but they've done absolutely nothing to implement it. Absolutely nothing. So the same discrimination that existed last year continues today. On our side, what I did is I went back and remind all of those previous reports with all those recommendations that we had come up with over the years that they could implement overnight to make kids' lives better. And then set out a place for longer-term reform where they'd come to you as community members and talk about what the children's actually are, needs are and cost out a formula to meet those needs. They've had these solutions. They've known about these recommendations for as long as 16 years. They've had them in this form, kind of like a grocery list of to-do since January 12th, and they still haven't done anything. It's the same thing like with Bryce, right? And Edward B's letter. Nothing's going to happen until you make it happen. You have to make it happen. Governments don't create change. They respond to change, right? They respond to change. You have to write. Get on Twitter, do an at Justin Trudeau, go see your member of parliament, send letters to the prime minister, do all of those things. Now, because um, I've been raising this issue about what are you doing now that you're facing a legally binding order, and the federal government has been saying they're broke because our neighbors in Alberta are not carrying their weight anymore, right? Um, but this is an important index for you to know about, and you should show, show it in your classrooms. It's a kids' rights index. It's done by the Kids' Rights Foundation. It ranks how well countries are doing proportionate to their wealth, right, for kids. And if you look at last year's rating, Canada ranks 57th in the world in terms of how well it's doing for children proportionate to its wealth. So even our economy that's not doing that well is doing far better than Canadian kids are. And this is all children. So you could imagine how poorly First Nations children would be in proportion to this. Now, why is the economy doing so much better than our kids? Because politicians spend a lot more time talking about the economy than our kids, right? And unfortunately, so do many of us. So do many of us. We need to provide that same level of attention to the children themselves. Uh, Project of Heart. I just want to put a, three cheers out to this group because they are, it's a free education program developed by teachers to bring teachings of residential schools into your communities. And uh, it's free of charge. And they teach the kids not just about residential schools, but what are the values and beliefs that made that happen, and how can we see discrimination today as children, and what can we do about it? So a lot of the kids from Project of Heart 
are learning about Bryce and Scott. And they're also the kids who are writing letters to the Prime Minister today for equality for kids, right? They're realizing there's things they can do as children, First Nations children and non-Aboriginal children too. So uh, projectaheart.ca. And there's the kids. This is this past uh, Have a Heart Day. How many of you have kids? Good. There's lots of you. So what we do is we ask children to write Valentines to the Prime Minister so that First Nations children can grow up safely in their families, get a good education, be healthy and proud of who they are. And this, uh, in Ottawa, we actually go in front of Parliament, and the kids have a microphone. So they read their letters out loud. And there was a child named Daxton. Well, he's not a child anymore. He used to be a child when he started the campaigns back in 2007. But as he said, Dear Prime Minister Trudeau, I have been up here for half of my life sending you these letters. And you are not doing anything. So you adults need to get off of the couch and actually stop this discrimination. Because in four years, I'm going to be old enough to vote. And I actually want to grow up in a country where no child is told no because of who they are. And that's a non-Aboriginal kid, right? So it's just as vital to teach the non-Aboriginal kids about this as it is the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children. So you can all get a part of Have a Heart Day, and I hope that you will be a part of our Honoring Memories, Planting Dreams by getting your children to do a heart in memory of the kids uh, who passed away that Bryce and Edward B. tried to save. And to put it on a planting stake and then to plant a heart garden around your school or in your community on the anniversary of the TRC report. This is the heart garden that the children planted at Rideau Hall. Um, and it was an absolutely beautiful garden. Because the kids would stand there, they had two hearts, one that they made and one that a child from across Canada made. And as the survivors came out of Rideau Hall, the children would pass one of the hearts to the survivors, and they would walk together to the garden to plant those stakes together, right? So who here thinks they can plant a heart garden? Even if you have an apartment, you can get a flower pot, right? You know, all of these things are free to do, right? And we must engage our children themselves in the change. We must model for them peaceful and respectful advocacy. And we must show them that we love them enough to stand up for them. You know, kids are so great at this stuff. When they see unfairness, they don't do what adults do, which is strike a committee, right? They do something about it. They do something about it. And I'm about to share with you a video done by some kids in Gatineau. These are non-Aboriginal and First Nations kids. And this past June, they wanted to do something special. They wanted to teach adults about reconciliation. They wanted to teach adults that you got to listen and then you got to do something. So they wrote this song and they made this music video in four days along with a guy named David Hodges. Do you want to see what they did? All right, and after you see what they did, I never want to hear you say, I don't know what to do, right? Here we go.
You can download that free of charge on iTunes, it's on my iPod, and you can show the kids in your schools this video. I received the decision four days before the rest of the world knew. I was at a graduation party and it came over my phone in a PDF file, and when I opened it up, the whole world went silent and time itself stopped moving. But I clicked on it and it said, this decision is about children, underlined. And I knew it was going to be OK. And I also knew that there was a promise I had to keep. So I went home. I got my gumboots on. I went and I bought a bouquet of daisies, the brightest ones I could find. And I walked down to Beechwood Cemetery, and I read the decision to Dr. Bryce and Edward B. And I told him I would be back when every person in this country stood with this generation of children so that we give the very best gift we can to the future, and that is to end racial discrimination as fiscal policy by Canada's 150th birthday. So when I make that trip in two years because of all of you, Put on your gum boots, stand up with your kids, and remember that the best way to defeat discrimination is with love, with glitter, and with action. Thank you very much. 